So welcome everyone to Live from Northwoods and Waters on this beautiful fall evening on September 19th, 2023. This is our first live as we begin our autumn season. And for those of you that are not familiar with Northwoods and Waters of the St. Croix Heritage Area, I thought I'd just spend just a few minutes, um, maybe four or five, telling you what we are doing here um, as, a, as a heritage area. Our goal is to unite the people of the St. Croix River watershed on behalf of the, our shared natural, cultural, and historic resources, of which we're really proud. The St. Croix watershed is a huge area. Um, sometimes it looks like a heart to me. Sometimes it looks like and feels like um, the map of Africa. It's a huge area. It's of almost 8,000 square miles. It encompasses two states, Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, touches 18 counties and 114, probably maybe more communities and encompasses 12,000 years of human history. And of course we have four sovereign nations here who have tribal rights still within the whole um, area, uh, our four sovereign nations. We have three major goals. These were established a long time ago, 14 years ago as we started to do workshops around the area to just answer the question, what would a national heritage area do for us? And we believe that what would likely happen is that there would be sustainable, sustainable economic opportunities based on our heritage. We also wanted to connect the region to help preserve and enhance the resources that we have. And we've been doing that all along. That has been the main um, purpose of all of our activities, including the one that we're participating in tonight. And then to increase awareness and understanding of the heritage stories and the resources that demonstrate those stories, both for the people who live here and for people who visit. And uh, there isn't a day that goes by that those of us who are working on the board or the committees or somehow involved with Northwoods and Waters that we don't learn something new. The United States right now has 61 national heritage areas and each one tells a significant part of our nation's story. There is no national heritage area in Minnesota or Wisconsin. So we're gonna plant our flag right there and, and become a national heritage area. So that's the fourth goal that we have. Um, and that will help us achieve all of the, the first three that I mentioned. Tonight we have with us uh, Dave Peters and Dave is gonna talk about Sand and Fire, his new book, Exploring a Rare Pine Barrens Landscape. And I'm gonna introduce Dave in just a moment. We are going to, um, we're going to start off tonight with uh, Thomas Wayne King, who has moderated many of these events. And Tom is going to do a, a reading for us, and he'll be back next month with our open mic series. So, Tom, take it away. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. This is just a, a meditation of a real event that happened and just gives you a little glimpse into life on the, the upper St. Croix Lake here where we are. It's called Mid-May Morning Magic on Upper St. Croix Lake. On a morning in mid-May, I was up early as usual to write at our old growth forest homestead in Solon Springs, headwaters of the St. Croix River, overlooking Upper St. Croix Lake with the start of the Brule River just north of us. As a determined, diligent writer across genres, my days start about 4 a.m. when I have quiet that allows me to think and create. I worked for a bit, then Sunshine, our four-year-old rescue Sheltie from St. Paul, had his breakfast and needed to go outside. We emerged from the front door into our yard, a respectful clearing in our tall, mature Norway and white pine forest with our large vernal pond not far away. Our early, still dark world was filled with sound. As we stepped down from our deck, our lone lake loon called through the springtime mist. New sun would soon peak over the east side of Upper St. Croix Lake, while crickets chirped a lush, sonic background. Peeper frogs joined in, loud. Some say they sound like sleigh bells. I don't think so. Chorus frogs, who really do sound like running your thumb down a plastic comb, filled in on the rhythm section while Sonny and I hiked our home trails. 
From south of us, near the Pine Barrens, laughing, yipping coyotes and their pups entered the rich audio mix. Woodpeckers up in our tall poplar trees added percussion on hollow sections. Across the lake, a wolf's resonant call sounded immediately answered by another wolf call from the same area. Likely a private conversation as wolves howl only to pack mates in their denning seasons of spring and into early summer. Later in the summer, they will call more to their neighbors. Out on the lake, our lone loon continued combining his calming call with all the other morning virtuosity we were hearing. As Sunshine and I walked home, our sonic surrounds included crickets chirping, peepers peeping, chorus frogs in full background performance, woodpeckers holding down the percussion section, coyotes laughing and yipping to fill in the rhythm section from out in the barrens, wolves across the lake adding their distinctive top line vocals, and our one lone lake loon contributing his guest solo a sunrise concert by our closest neighbors in Solon Springs, mid-May morning magic on Upper St. Croix Lake. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tom. We appreciate your uh, great reading. And when I listen to that, it, it, it just reminds me that the barrens are anything but barren. They are full yeah. of sounds and wildlife. And so we thank you so much. One more thing I wanna do before I turn the whole program over to Dave is to introduce you to our new executive director. We are absolutely thrilled. We have been working for 14 years almost entirely um, with volunteers. And due to the generosity of the Fred C. and Catherine B. Anderson Foundation and another um, anonymous donor, uh, we were able to hire our first executive director. And so it is my pleasure to introduce you to Monica Zaki. Monica, yay. Hey, thank you. I don't know how to follow up <laughs> with all of that greatness and excitement. Um, it is nice to meet you all. Um, I Do you want me to say a little bit? Marty's like, this will just be kind of casual. <laughs> <laughs> Say whatever you'd like, Monica. <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. Um, I love the St. Croix. Um, I came uh, from, well, I worked for Wild Rivers Conservancy for about 10 years and before that for watershed districts. And um, I my background is in water and conservation. And um, I'm really excited to help take um, Northwoods and Waters, you know, to this next phase and this next step. So it's really a privilege to be here. Thanks, you know, Marty for the nice uh, introduction. And I'm Thank you, um, David, for being here. I'm really interested and in looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Monica. Monica is really the right person at the right time, and we're really fortunate to have her leading the charge now. Um, let's see. Oh, another person I want to introduce you to is Jasmine Co Collins. Um, Jasmine has been with us now for what four months? I think at least um, since Jasmine May. Yeah. Since May. Yeah, Jasmine is our communications specialist, and she'll tell you a little bit at the end about um, uh, about our social media and how you can engage with, with the social media that we have. Um, but she's also a, a um, consummate theater person, and so uh, she's the very perfect person to moderate these uh, live sessions. So she's going to start doing that next time. So Next time you'll get to have Thomas Wayne King and Jasmine Collins will be in great hands as we do an open mic session. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dave Peters. Um, this, is, this is what was um, written in your, uh, I think on Amazon was where I pulled this one up, Dave. So you'll have to just uh, add to it or change it or whatever. But um, Dave Peters is a retired journalist with extensive experience reporting and editing for some of these papers. So if his name sounds familiar, you may have read uh, him in the St. Paul Pioneer Press, the, Minnesota, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Minnesota Public Radio, and other news organizations. David is an avid member of the board of the Friends of the Namakagan Barrens Wildlife Area, which is where I first met you, Dave, on a very early morning. I remember. Um, and he walks the barrens as often as he can, finding new wonders every time. He and his wife live in St. Paul, period. But 
we have granted you honorary citizenship in the St. Croix watershed. <laughs> you can claim any residence you want here. Thank you. So we welcome, join me in welcoming, please, David Peters. Thank you. Thank and you, Marty. Thank you for inviting me to do this. And yeah, it feels like I'm in the St. Croix watershed much of my life. So uh, I think, uh, uh, and congratulations, Monica. This is a, that's a big step for the, for the heritage area and I uh, hope all goes well. Uh, I know at least a few of the people on this call know a lot about the bear, the Namakagan Barrens, <clears throat> and have taught me about the Namakagan Barrens, but it always surprises me um, how little known they are, even for people who are quite familiar with the, the area, the region, the St. Croix, the, the St. Croix Valley. Uh, as Mark, who's on the call, is fond of saying, you have to be lost to find them, and that was true in my case, and uh, I think is true for a lot of people. Uh, what I thought I would do is read a little bit from the beginning of Sand and Fire, uh, my book, and then uh, if we can make the screen sharing thing work, uh, share a few images, vi uh, visuals from the book, and then just uh, talk a little bit about what else is in the book, and uh, finally uh, open it up and talk about whatever people want to talk about. And Marty, uh, if I lose track of the time, don't be afraid to get the hook out and uh, drag me off the stage. So uh, I'll start right at the beginning, chapter one. It's called Coming Upon the Barrens. On a mild, sun-filled July morning, I was picking blueberries about a quarter mile south of the pristine Namakagan River in northwestern Wisconsin. The sky was a fresh blue, a promise of afternoon heat kissed the air, and I was daydreaming about the Christmas blueberry cobbler that has become a tradition in my family. Not far away in the brush was a family from nearby Spooner, also picking berries and chatting. And suddenly, one of the women stood up from her children and her ice cream bucket of berries, looked around the clearing, and asked with some awe in her voice, where are we? The barons, I hollered, trying to be helpful. How do you spell that, she wondered. This book is my answer to both of her questions. She's among the many people near and far who've been intrigued by an unusual landscape with a rich human history, but know little about it. Let's start in the middle of the Namakagan Barrens wildlife area. We're just beside a sandy road named St. Croix Trail. About five miles to the southwest, the tannin-laced, sturgeon-filled Namakagan River flows into the St. Croix River. Every summer, thousands of canoeists, fishermen, and tubers float past that wooded river junction, but not many folks stop here. A dark concrete foundation about 36 by 30 feet lies in the brush. Three jack pines lean over what once was the tiny forest home school. For several decades in the early 1900s, children walked, rode horses, or slayed here to receive an education. A succession of women taught at the school over the years. The building burned once, was rebuilt by nearby residents, and finally closed in 1938. What little remains is nearly hidden, and bluebirds and swallows vie to use the wooden box behind the foundation for testing, for nesting, I'm sorry. Mark this point on your mental map. It may not look like it, but a lot has happened here. Roaring meltwaters once poured from thick glaciers, leaving deep deposits of sand. People known today as Paleo-Indians likely hunted here with stone-tipped spears. Later came people tracking deer and picking berries. Fire after fire burned. Treaties forced the land to change hands. Surveyors, loggers, and land speculators came and went. Stagecoaches rolled through. Probably a dozen languages were spoken within earshot at one point. Farmers tried to work the land and then left. Habitat conservationists squabbled with foresters. But for now, if you have come upon these barrens for the first time, just notice the expanse, a land you thought was supposed to wrap you in the blanket of a dark northern forest is missing its trees and instead leaves you bathed in light. It delivers nothing so much as a sense of space. Let me skip ahead a little bit. I feel the pull to get out on the land every time I visit the Barrens. Maybe it's my prairie upbringing, 
Maybe it's an appreciation of the network of plants here that is constantly in flux as well as rare. Maybe it's knowing that for all the land's emptiness, many people have preceded me and tried to thrive here. I think the same thought every time. Put one foot in front of the other, tread the sandy ground, and observe. What I see is different every time. On an early spring day, delicate pastel pask flowers emerged from the dry sand next to the old school foundation. Wild or planted a hundred years ago by a young teacher or student. In July, the sharp tang of blueberries is a reminder that people have enjoyed the bounty here for thousands of years. A half dozen sharp-tailed grouse burst from the undergrowth, startling me and blasting into the air, wings beating hard for a hundred yards before the birds settle again. Grouse are a key to this landscape, an indicator of how well a diminished ecosystem is thriving. Deer leap for cover, a bald eagle stares, then lifts off a dead pine. Towhees and brown thrashers sing and flit and dash. A porcupine ambles into a small stand of trees. A homesteader's family, a homesteader family's century-old lilac still bloom near what once was a farmhouse. A wolf crosses a sandy road, looks up, then vanishes in the brush. One glorious clear morning, a crescent moon rises just before the sun, first orange, then white as the world starts to glow. On a January day, my wife and I snowshoe amid wild turkey tracks. In May, insect-eating pitcher plants poke their hungry red tubes out of the bog's bright green sphagnum moss waiting for protein in the form of a fly. In August, monarch butterflies cluster in the jack pines, readying for the long migration to Mexico. If I listen, I can imagine the drums of an Ojibwe summer gathering, the laughter of an end of winter party at a nearby log home, or even the crackling of a fire that brought tragedy to an immigrant Swedish family just down the road. I really am in awe when I go out there, whether I'm, uh, you know, lying on my belly looking at some new rare fern, grape fern or something, or staring up at the dark uh, skies at night, or maybe stumbling on some foundation of an old farmhouse. Um, let me try to make this screen sharing work. See if all is well. There we go. Is that looking okay? Okay, and can, whoops, there. Can you see the pointer? Does the pointer work? Okay. We can, Dave. Very good, okay, excellent. Here we go, uh, for the curious among you, I may or may not be wearing the same shirt I was when my author photo was taken. I have a bunch of these. Um, I didn't really intend, I've said, said this before, I didn't really intend to write a book, uh, I just got interested in the place and started taking notes and talking to people, got involved with the friends of the Namakagan Barons, found some botanists and other people, uh, historians, geologists who were happy to talk. And finally, my wife suggested that I do something useful with it. And uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society Press uh, agreed to publish it. So all was good. The barons are a little bit hard to understand or uh, to describe because they're complicated. They change. They come and they go a little bit. Uh, they're hard to take a picture of, too, but uh, it's hard to do it from the ground. But a friend, Don McConkie, got his drone up in the air for me one, early one morning and took this really nice picture of the of the barons. You, it's all here. The, the uh, stubby little jack uh, uh, scrub oaks in front and some jack pines, especially off in the distance. Lots of prairie willow and uh, New Jersey tea and other brush like blueberries and sweet ferns. There's a drainage off here in the distance, Clemens Creek, uh, heading toward the St. Croix off to the left. Um, but what you really see is how flat this all this glacial outwash sand is. And you can imagine, you're looking north here and you right by the school foundation, and you can imagine staring up at a great big glacier 
thousands of feet thick uh, and, and the water just pouring out toward you. If you've been to Alaska or maybe Iceland and seen those glaciers, that's what this was. Just massive amounts of water carrying huge amounts of sand out onto the, onto the plains and laying it, laying it down. Of course, some people, this is what the Barrens is all about, blueberries, blueberry gathering. Um, every summer, the Friends has a blueberry gathering, and even even on a bad blueberry year, the the uh, burgers and the beer is still free. So, um, these are the the pask flowers that grow near the Schoolhouse Foundation that I mentioned in the in the beginning. Uh, wood lilies are probably the showiest of the flowers on the on the barrens. There are other kinds of barrens. There are other barrens elsewhere, I should say. Uh, New England, New Jersey. Uh, New York, there are some barrens. They tend to be different in at least a couple of ways. I mean, same kind of sandy, low nutrient soil um, and brush, but they tend to be different in at least two ways. The pines out east are pitch pines, not jack pines, and they tend to be a little less prairie-like, less fewer flowers and, and uh, grass like big blue stem and that sort of thing. I like to take pictures of the moon, so I just have to include this sunrise, just before sunrise. And the monarch butterflies. I didn't know they hung out in jack pines till I saw them, I think, one or two Augusts ago. There they, there they were, hundreds of them getting ready to fly south. And, of course, the sharp-tailed grouse. That's what other people come to the Barrens for. You can reserve a, a blind in... Uh, April, May, and uh, watch one of the most hilarious, interesting acts in in nature, watching the, the mating dance of the sharp-tailed grouse. And that's really why the barrens are preserved, is to ma maintain habitat for the grouse. But it all comes back to sand, starts with sand. These are the Northwest sands, which again, a lot of people are not really familiar with as a landform in, in Wisconsin, but they run from down here, uh, St. Croix Falls, roughly, all the way up to Bayfield. And it's about 150 miles, and uh, that's a lot of sand. They're hundreds of feet thick in some places. The St. Croix River runs right along the, it's the state boundary here, and run tends to run along the northwest side of the sands. But it was all laid down about 12,000 years ago, 10, 12, 14,000 years ago. Um, in 1917, there was a, a debate. Wisconsin wanted to put a highway through here, and they were trying to decide whether to run it east-west or north-south. Here's the Barrens up here. And the a Burnett County Commissioner said, well, don't run it up there. All that is is swamps and red sand. Um, and he was pretty much right, pretty much right. Here's how thick it is. This is a quarry, a sand quarry. Uh, north of the Namakagan Barrens, you can see how thick it is, and you can see these bedding plains that were the where the cross bedding, where the wind blew the sand into into dunes, and it generates or affects uh, what grows. This is a map of uh, the vegetation of Wisconsin when uh, European settlers arise, and you can see that sand. Uh, belt right here shows up this the gray the gray color the light brown color that's jack pine white pine red pine are the darker green all around here but the sandy area is jack pine and if you put a map up of uh, fire frequency it would look the same you'd see the same belt here of the most most frequently burned area in uh, in Wisconsin. So if you left this land alone, it would grow up into mature red pine and jack pine, probably. But the thing is, it never was really left alone. It burned uh, repeatedly, uh, natural fires, human set fires. And that's another thing that um, is good to keep in mind. This is really a cultural landscape. People have been on this land for thousands of years, shaping it, taking food from it manipulating it, burning it, farming it, logging it. So it's not a pristine wilderness. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. It's a cultural land that um, is managed to uh, uh, to ends that we we think are most beneficial. 
and people have been here for a long time. I've told, I've said this before, my, my, when I started writing this book, what I really wanted to be able to say is that the first people on the Barrens were mammoth hunters, you know, like the diorama and the museum, the guys and the big, the fur and the <clears throat> spears trying to take down big woolly mammoths. Well, it, it did happen. And there's evidence that that happened in Southern Wisconsin and Northern Illinois, but uh, it did not, unfortunately, from my point of view, did not happen on the Barrens. Uh, the mammoths went extinct uh, before the ice left the Barrens. So the first, the first people were not mammoth hunters, but they were hunting caribou and maybe bison eventually. Um, people were on, there are, there are a couple of archaeological sites nearby, Solon Springs and Gordon, which both have evidence uh, artifacts of that are put at late paleo indian which is about ten thousand years ago um so people would have been wandering in this area at that time um and of course people come people go cultures change um this eventually for a long time became dakota country uh, and then 1600s 1700s uh, Ojibwe people came in from the east and became the dominant people on this land, and it was part of their seasonal rounds. They, they would they would move through the land using this area for uh, blueberries and fishing in the Saint Croix River, wintering up by Lake Superior maybe for maple syrup country, um, but clearly was uh, Ojibwe homeland, and it was Ojibwe leaders who in 1837 ceded this big chunk of uh, central Minnesota, central Wisconsin to the U.S. government in the Pine Tree Treaty. And you can tell from the name, the, the government, the U.S. government was not interested in this land for settlement or that sort of thing, but for the pine trees, the main, first of all, the big white pines that everybody knows about, um, and this opened the treaty opened opened this land up for uh, for timber interests. It did not take away hunting rights and fishing rights from Ojibwe, and it did not force them to leave. Although there were later efforts, really, to make um, Ojibwe people leave, but they obviously, of course, are still there uh, in numbers. Oh, 1837, and not by coincidence, is the date, or the year that uh, the city of Chicago was incorporated. They, they hadn't invented steel sky, skyscrapers yet, so that lumber had to come from somewhere. Came from here. And before long, stagecoaches were rolling through. This You can go out on the Barrens, and if the time of day is right, the season is right, after a burn, you can see these ruts that were created when the, there was regular stagecoach service by the 1850s, 60s, 70s, uh, into the 80s before railroads uh, more or less made them, made them obsolete. And logging peaked in about the 1890s. And after that, the push was on for farming. In 1895, the state of Wisconsin commissioned the Dean of Agriculture in Madison, the University of Wisconsin, to write a handbook for farming, to promote farming. And he and a few other professors came up to Northern uh, Wisconsin and found that it was gonna be great. Huge hay crops, potatoes, truck gardens like, uh, like New Jersey. And uh, they urged people to come. There were immigration commissions, both the state and county level brought people in from uh, um, Europe, from the rest of the Midwest. Uh, there were lots of promotions. Rail the railroad got a lot of this land as an incentive to build a track to Lake Superior. And they were interested in promoting land and, and uh, um, getting, getting farmers to come up. Um, and they did. Iowa, Milwaukee, uh, Norway, Sweden, Prussia, they homesteaded, they bought land, um, they grew oats, hay, potatoes, they planted fruit trees, they had livestock, they uh, uh, planted lilac bushes, they built the little school, they had a cemetery, they voted. Uh, there was a little community here. And if you ask them where they lived, I, I think they would probably tell you Five Mile because that was the name of a little general store and a post office for a short time, just over the county line into uh, into Washburn County. 
I know this is impossible to read for people, but uh, I thought I would show it anyway. This is a this is this is a uh, a page from the 1910 census. Uh, right now, if you drive along St. Croix Trail, there's nobody there. Nobody lives there. But it was called at that time Minong Road, which is written sideways here. And uh, there were families up and down, up and down that road. The Gages, Joseph and Sarah Gage, came from Milwaukee. Benjamin Hillock was from uh, Iowa, but his wife, Ruby, was Ruby Gage, the daughter of these two people. So there were families came up here together. They had a lot of kids. I asked a descendant of Benjamin Hillock why his, uh, I think it was grandfather, finally left. And he said it was too dang cold. I think there's probably more to it than that, but that was a, one reason. The Krause family was there The from Milwaukee. This is Arvid Lyons' name. That's one of the saddest cases on the, on the Barons, I think. Ingelbrit and Severina Bratley were here. They uh, came from uh, Norway. And if you can find their homestead, it's down in County Land, actually right next to the wildlife area where it's wooded. And at the, if you're there at the right time of year, uh, their lilacs still bloom, the Bratley's lilacs in the, right next to the Barrens. This is the foundation of the school, the little school that people, uh, kids went to, got their lessons in, lasted until 1938, like I said. And then they uh, left one by one. The Krauses left and the Hillocks left and um, the Hillocks went south, Arkansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico. But to me, as I said, Arvid Lyons is the most poignant story among these settlers. Arvid Lyons was born in Sweden in the 1840s, and he came to America as a young man in, the, in his 20s. And he was here about 20 years, and I don't know where. I wish I could find out where he was. But at any rate, he went back to Sweden and married, got married to Augusta Anders' daughter. And about as fast as is humanly possible, they produced 10 kids in the 1890s. And the next thing you know, they were on a ship coming back to America. And they told the regist people registering them at the on the ship that they were heading for New Mexico. They had a friend in New Mexico. Another mystery. I'd like to find out why they never made it. But they wound up in northwestern Wisconsin instead. And uh, there they are in the 1905 census. By that time, they had another kid. So there was 11 kids, Arvid and Augusta. And then uh, tragedy hit. Uh, one of the, A four-year-old daughter, Ruth, was burned and was killed. Uh, and then by 1910, in the 1910 census, Arvid was a widower. He was living with his oldest daughter, Anna, and uh, the other kids had been farmed out to neighbors. They were listed as foundlings. They'd been adopted by, by neighbors. And it wasn't too long after that that Arvid deeded his land over to his daughter and promptly died. And he's buried in the cemetery on the Barrens. There's only a couple of names on markers there, and his, his is one of them. Um, I talked to a great granddaughter of his who was a little bit aware of the Baron's history, but when I told her what I knew, she said, uh, she said, yeah, Grandpa Ernie always said his mom died in a fire, but that's about all she knew. Um, poignant tale, poignant tale. Every time I go there, that, that, there the Arvid Lions property is the is where the uh, little cabin is. The hunter it used to be a hunter's cabin. It's where the D, the DNR has a little headquarters. The Friends has their act, activities at the at our on Arvid Lions's homestead. It's pretty much wooded in now. But every time I go there, I kind of wonder wonder about what happened there. So by the 1930s, people were gone uh, pretty much. There was a geographer who came through working on his PhD, and he noted that uh, buildings had crumbled by 1930, and more poignantly, the kids were all gone. He said there were no kids left on the on the Barrens. Uh, this was a, well, I should say there, there were at the same time, there was a, there, just west of the Barrens, there was a little 
no, hardly even a village, a settlement, a couple of families of Ojibwe. And they lived there, the Kennebecs lived there into the 30s as well. And John Kennebec died in 1938, the last Ojibwe on or near the, living near the Barrens. So by 1938, it was empty. And that, as it happens, is the year that these era, this aerial photo was taken. And this is St. Croix Trail right along here. This is the Benjamin Hillock farm field. Still, you could still see it years later. Krause's lived here. Arvid Lyons lived right here. That was where he homesteaded. And this is the school right there. It was When this photo was taken, the building was still up. If you look real close, you can see a structure there. But what I like best about this photo is if you look real close, right down here, there's a little tiny trail going down to the Brantley homestead. This is where the lilacs still bloom, and this is how the kids got to school. They walked this little path that you could still see in 19, 1938. So the people were gone, the residents were gone, put it that way, um, but the fighting wasn't over. The, the Most of the land, almost all the land had, had gone back to the county, Burnett County, most of it, uh, for back taxes. And they were interested in uh, uh, growing trees for revenue, timber cutting. Uh, but people started to realize uh, through the late 30s, the 40s, into the 50s that the sharp-tailed grouse habitat was disappearing in Wisconsin, and uh, a movement began to preserve it, save some of it. And two people who were instrumental were uh, Frederick and Francis Hammerstrom. They came to Wisconsin from out east working on the government resettlement program that helped farmers and you know, others find more productive land and move off of barrens and similar kinds of uh, terrain. Uh, and they, their mentor was this guy, Aldo Leopold, father of, I guess, the conservation ethic of today. The grouse were the really the, the thing that they wanted to save, the habitat for the grouse. Today, I mean, it's still important and people still count them and try hard to keep the grouse numbers up and the, the genetics varied. But really, people talk more and more about not just about saving a specific species, but uh, preserving an ecosystem because it is globally quite a, a rare, a rare kind of place. So it's become more of a, an ecosystem effort to preserve. And this is how they do it today. This is the DNR burning uh, a piece of the barrens. The Baron, the Amacoggin barrens are about 6,800 acres. I can't remember exactly, something like that. And uh, they want to burn it. They try to burn it about every six or seven years. So that's a rotation of about a thousand acres a year that uh, they get out with their crews and and burn it to the ground. It is really a lovely uh, place, beauty and solitude, and uh, uh, it repays uh, visits again and again. So there you go. I would be happy to talk about whatever people want to talk about. And as I say, I'm always a little intimidated by uh, some of these talks because there are people on this Zoom call who know more about the Barons than I do. So uh, <laughs> they can join in they, and you know who you are. That was all fascinating, David. Um, I have a feeling you could you could talk for twenty four hours straight about this, about all you've you've learned and seen and experienced. Um, yeah, let's just have an open discussion about the barons and any questions that you have for David. Can you unmute? You need to unmute, Tom. There we go. How's that? That's perfect. There you go. Okay. Um, just the origin of the name. I find it interesting. Um, you noted barons throughout the country. And yet you, and when I see I'm a fan of the far north and there's references, you know, in the Arctic barons. And I think uh, Seton wrote a book, uh, The Arctic Prairies, which was basically the barons. Can you give us any sense of how long ago was it referred to as the Barrens? 
Uh, that's a good question. Um, and I don't have a very good answer for that. But it is, yeah, it, it's a kind of an ill-defined term. Um, I think most people, at least around here, when they use that term, they're not they're they're talking about open uh terrain, but not a prairie, more brush than a prairie, trees, but not tall trees like a savanna. And Gary uh, Dunsmore, correct me when I'm going astray here, but it, it is a little bit of a slippery definition. Um, it's somewhere between, well, I think people, I think pe some people would say that the term brush prairie is synonymous with barrens, but um, it's a little I bit. Know. Almost like a uh, savanna, but, but without the big, typically I think of like oaks, like bur oaks and scattered oaks it's and, and yet it's interesting because people have negative connotations often with the word barren and yeah. yet you've shown and illustrated just how rich and vibrant and diverse it is and it's always struck me as as interesting and when i grew up in the north branch area when people would talk about the wisconsin barrens i always you knew where they were talking about so it's yeah. in my whole life i've heard of it the area you wrote your book on uh, as the barrens yeah well, you know, now, now that I'm thinking about your original question, there was the, the, the original surveyors who came through in, in this area was 1855. You can look at their notebooks uh, where they were they were noting the soil and the trees. And they were using the word barrens in 1855. Wow. So I don't know. You know, it's it's hard. The, the surveyors weren't all consistent. It's hard to know exactly what that what it meant, what that word meant to them. But uh, I think it's intriguing. I, I it has that mystery about it. I like it. Hmm. Yeah. I thought you were going when you said something about the name. I thought you were asking about Namakagan. Namakagan, by the way, means place of the sturgeon. Ah, in Ojibwe. Is it possible barrens just means no trees? Well, um, there are trees. That's the thing. But, but not very many. It seemed like it was mostly in the background in your pictures. Well, if you go up there, I mean, it varies over the landscape. But uh, yeah, there are places where the trees are actually quite concentrated, but they're like five feet high, 10 feet high. And the oak trees especially are, are really interesting. That when, when they burn them, they, the oak trees burn back to the ground and the roots stay alive and they come back from the roots again and again and again. So you get these really big and really old oak roots. You know, the, the, do you know, the, have the, has the DNR thought of reintroducing like ungulates like not not like deer but like bison into parts of it i've never heard that one gary mm -hmm. have they ever put ever anybody it's, ever thought about you know um 20 25 years ago there's discussion within even the state legislature that they wanted to introduce at least one big ungulate so they they looked at um, the woodland caribou, they looked at moose, and they looked at elk. Uh, long story short, elk won. So we now have elk in Wisconsin again. Mm -hmm. But not on Bison, the I don't think we're ever considered, unfortunately, in a way. Mm -hmm. There is a moose. Uh, every once in a while, somebody see a moose wanders through, but not introduced. Yeah, they just... They Wandering from Minnesota in the UP. Yeah. It's wonderful to drive through there now and see elk crossing signs. <laughs> it's like, wow, they're, they're so well introduced that they're now a traffic hazard, which is just terrific. <laughs> Dave, you mentioned the blueberry picking event. What, what was that? Could you expand on that? The uh, Friends of the Namakagan Barrens has for a number of years on the third Saturday of July uh, held a blueberry gathering and anybody is welcome to come. Uh, there's food, there's drink. And the way we've done it in the past few years, 
um, you get a map, you show up early, like 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, you get a map showing uh, if we've done our job very well, showing where you might find some blueberries if you go out on the barrens. And so you go out and you pick to your heart's content, and then you come back and li listen to some chit chat and have some burgers. <laughs> that, right? That's, that's about the size of it, I guess. Sounds like fun. But, yeah, third Saturday of every July. So Carol Abrek is, is online with us. Carol, if you're there, I, I have a question for you because this is the first time, Dave, as you were showing the map, I saw that there's the the Barnes Barrens up there and that's where, where, um, where Carol's from. So how, how are the Barnes Barrens the same or the different from the Namakagan Barrens, Carol? What's it like? Well, you know, I, I can't, I'm not, Good at being able to say that because I really am not that familiar with the Namakagan Barrens. Um, I would say though, when you talk about what you've mentioned just today, as you were talking and showing the pictures, is that the those, the Barrens that I know in Barnes would look familiar to that. I mean, similar to that, the scrub oak and the um, you know scattered trees and that kind of thing. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time in the Barrens personally, um, but but I would say that they would look similar. Um, maybe Dave, have you been up to the Barnes Barrens? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think you know there are a couple of botanists who've spent a lot of time looking all through those the Northwest Sands, and they could tell you that there are some species differences as you go north to south or south to north. The species, the plant species, change a little bit, but uh, you know, not the the general uh, definition of of scrub oaks and jack pines. I think would would be similar. I didn't really. I I tried to get into it in the book. I didn't tonight about that. that the notion of a corridor along the sands, Barnes Barrens, the Moqua Barrens. Uh, Douglas County sanctuary, bird sanctuary, uh, all the way down to Crex Meadows. Those are all public lands, and that's why this area that um, uh, conservationists are trying to, in a way, connect those into a corridor, better for the for the sharp-tailed grouse, and and kind of return that whole idea of a of a corridor of barrens. Um, throughout that whole that whole stretch, so that's kind of the grand scheme in the long run. We had Brian. And my understanding. Go ahead. Oh, no, I, my understanding is that they um, that there's a there's a a schedule of the, the the land is divided into sections, and that on X number of years they will burn a section and then that section doesn't get touched until the other second, third and fourth get touched. And then it recycles to maintain that kind of a um, environment. Yeah. Um, and I, that's, go ahead. It, that's, it's a, it's a pretty innovative effort. I think if I, if I understood it right, there's kind of a core area that they keep open, try to keep open. And I think burn, mm -hmm. but then these four chunks around that core area, they will cut um, every, and it's a long, long cycle, like a hundred years. Right. Um, yeah. But it's a right way there. to maintain yeah. a very specific kind of environment. They do that yeah, as they, well they, for the oh, for the habitat, you know, to have those open areas that's required for like the sharp-tailed grouse. So sometimes you hear like rolling barrens, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're doing those large blocks like Carol was, you know, talking about of maintaining that open while the rest of it's growing and then cycle it through the landscape. So you always have that some areas of like a big mosaic <laughs> you know yeah, for, yeah, for right. sharp tail and for some of those species that really um require that that land habitat i think there's a lot more cooperation among agencies than there was even maybe 10 years ago i suppose the counties counties try to uh 
cooperate or, or coordinate with the state. You know, if they're cutting an area for timber, they try to do it kind of in sync so that their larger areas get opened up. And so the, the foresters and the habitat people might once have been at each other's necks. Uh, there may be a little more cooperation now. That's my sense of it anyway. There's a lot of cooperation <laughs> <laughs> now. Yes. DNR, County Forest, even the U.S. Forest Service, you know, yeah. you have this, yeah, huge area of public land. A Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, too, has a strong partnership with all of those agencies. So I have the, the sad task to uh, wind us down here. Um, David, this has been absolutely fascinating. And I'd love for you to put in our in the chat the information again about where we can get your book. Um, so I'm going to give you a break. We'll come back to you and let you say any last final words that you have. Monica, we're going to do an event in um, just a little bit up in the Barrens. You want to share uh, some in, a little bit of information about what that is? Awesome. Look at you. Oh, I see you kind oh. of an interesting looking. <laughs> there you go. Let me get it over there for oh. you. Fantastic. So October 7th, um, that afternoon, it's a Saturday, um, Douglas County Wildlife Area up there um, in that Gordon area. We are hosting an event featuring our Northern Forest. We're calling this a Heritage Highlight. So um, the pub, it's a free event. We're going to have a forester from Douglas County come and talk about our forests, the past, present, and future uh, of them um, in that area. And then um, it'll will there'll be organizations like North Country Trail and us and um, Douglas County the the friends groups lots of um, exhibitors that we can um, talk to Kathleen Wallet um, we'll have we'll have some photography there and then afterwards we're gonna have kind of an activity of choice an opportunity to hike the North Country Trail uh, we'll have a campfire and music. And it should be a really good time and some s'mores for um, you sweet lovers, <laughs> you know, out there. So please join us if you're um, if you're free and available that weekend. It should be it should be a really good time. It should be a beautiful time there. And yeah. also the calendar for the next live from Northwoods and Waters. Um, Thomas Wayne King is going to be leading uh, moderating an open mic. Jasmine Collins will be introducing and uh, also moder moderating and there'll be St. Croix poets and authors. It is always a, um, it's an eclectic and really fun event. Um, so we invite you to that. Um, so um, Jasmine, can you tell people a little bit about how to, um, how to stay connected with us? For sure. Uh, before we move into that, I do want to slip in that the next live is on my birthday. So as a birthday present, you should all join us again <laughs> um, next month. <laughs> um, as for the social media, um, I have taken over as one of my duties as communications intern, all of the outreach on our platforms. And so if you're not already following us, you can follow those QR codes to get to our profiles. And if there's something that you would like to see shared on the social media accounts or you have ideas for that, please reach out to me as I'm more than happy to hear those. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Dave again for being uh, our presenter and thank all of you for joining us. David, do you have any last minute things that have kind of popped into your head of what you'd like to share as, as we uh, close out today? Well, thank you again for inviting me. This was, this is fun. I, I, like you say, I enjoy talking about the Barrens and I just uh, would urge people to get out and, uh, and look around, uh, explore. There aren't really any marked trails on the Barrens, but you don't really need them. You just walk around and, you know, there's not much to get in your way. Uh, so enjoy it. And uh, you mentioned the book. You can get the you can order the book through any bookstore or book drop dot uh, org. And uh, it, it's not that hard. You can even find it at the company with the big A. So. 
Support your local bookstores if you can, of course. <laughs> I know the North, North Winds Bookstore in Spooner has it, or at least had it, and the Crex Meadows Visitor Center had it. So Wonderful. Well, on behalf of all of us, we thank you so much for joining us. And My pleasure. So I will close out then. This has been live from Northwoods and Waters. Thank Okay, uh, thanks for uh, waiting for me there. I, I had great trouble signing in. I think it doesn't like this iPad. I'm not sure what's up. I'm not on my PC tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>